This is an extraordinary book, and it's frightening. It's about your economy, my economy, our economy, and why it got into the shape it did. Gretchen, this goes a long way back. The trouble goes a long way back. Just could you start us off in how did we get into this mess? And I'm not claiming that this is the beginning where we start, but my co-author, Josh Rosner, and I go back to the early 1990s. Um, and the reason that we felt that we had to go back in time uh, at least that far was that we both believed that uh, a debacle this large, one that really has claimed so much um, agony and pain for homeowners, um, investors that have created trillions of dollars in losses really could not possibly have happened overnight. And so going back in time, um, we really found a good place to start was 1991, which was right after the savings and loan crisis, which was an interesting um, moment in time, which is very almost sort of predictive of what we are now going through, but on a much smaller scale. But in any case, so it was 1991, Congress was wrestling with the idea that the SNL crisis had taken a very large toll, and they wanted to know how they could possibly protect shareholders and protect tax holders in the future, taxpayers in the future from any such losses at other institutions. A great focus for Congress at that time was Fannie Mae and Freddie Mac because they were the mortgage finance companies that facilitated borrowers' uh, ability to um, uh, borrow to buy homes. They weren't lenders themselves, but what they were were government-sponsored enterprises that were really in place to kind of facilitate the borrowing process, make it easier for homeowners to get money to buy homes. And so Congress was rightly worried that if the SNL crisis had created losses among those institutions, that there may be losses lurking in the books at Fannie and Freddie. We focus mostly on Fannie because it was the far larger of the two. And this was an important moment because as Congress was weighing increasing the regulation of Fannie to protect taxpayers against losses, in steps the CEO of the company a man by the name of James Johnson, who really sort of um, took over the process and actually helped to write the legislation to make sure that their regulator would be weak, to make sure that their, <clears throat> their capital requirements, i.e. the cushion of reserves that they had to set aside to protect against future losses, to make sure that that level would be microscopic lower capital requirements, increase the profits for the companies and therefore the profits to the individuals running the companies. So you have a moment in time where this whole process that was designed to protect the taxpayers gets hijacked by the CEO of Fannie Mae and his political friends. And he made, it into, he made this company into a political animal that did anything to protect the government subsidy and the lucrative perquisites that went along with that subsidy. This was supposed to be to benefit housing for Americans. As you read this book, it looks like well, there were good intentions. Was this a case of good intentions gone wrong, or was this more, more malevolent? It certainly comes out in your book as being much more malevolent. So housing. Uh, what? Where, where, did, where did all this go wrong? Housing was, of course, a central part of the story because Fannie Mae was supposed to facilitate um, borrowing and to ease the cost, uh, lower the cost of borrowing. But what created the ability for the company to really hijack the process to, um, <clears throat> to make feeble its regulator, to lower capital requirements, to buy off Congress, and to neutralize critics, was its ability to wrap itself in the American flag of home ownership. So uh, essentially, Fannie Mae would say any, to any critic who criticized it, well, you're against housing. And housing is a noble cause. And it is indeed a noble cause. I mean, there is a view that uh, if you own your own home, it's a more stable community, um, maybe better school systems, et cetera. But, this, so, so Fannie Mae was able to wrap itself in the American flag of home ownership with this noble idea and to pervert it 
for its own purposes. And so you had the company um, running roughshod over critics. You had the company um, making sure it had friends in Congress. And what was crucial was the company had this ability to borrow money from the capital markets from investors at a lower cost than another bank uh, uh, like a uh, financial institution. And so that amount of money, that difference between what Fannie Mae could borrow in the capital markets from and what, say, J.P. Morgan can borrow from in the capital markets was an enormous subsidy delivered to the company that they used for their own purposes. We had uh, Fannie Mae as Federal National Mortgage Association. They could purchase mortgages. If your banker makes you a mortgage and had to keep the mortgage, as in the old days, then the bank really was liable for that mortgage. But if you can pass it on, then you, this was the advent of the, you know, Ginnie Mae certificates, Fannie Mae certificates, all sorts of certificates of bundled loans. Home mortgages were, a, as Gretchen well knows and explains in here, home mortgages were seen as the AAA credit the best, most reliable credit, because if you own a home, you're going to fight to, to pay that loan. So this was in, in support of spreading home ownership, which is a noble goal, and making mortgages affordable, but something went wrong in that affordable stuff. Could well, what, what went wrong was this was a real government push. Um, it began in the mid-90s. Uh, after the SNL crisis, home ownership rates started to decline. President Clinton felt that this was worrisome, wanted to um, sort of get both public and private um, uh, resources to pushing towards increasing home ownership. It had been in a band tra in a, like 62, 63, between 60 and 63 percent home ownership for many, many years, and they wanted to push it up to 70 percent. And they got it pretty darn close. They got it to 69 and change. Um, but what it involved was it meant that uh, it opened the door to predatory lending. It opened the door to loans that were um, very alluring to unsophisticated people who didn't understand them, that had very high costs, that were extremely profitable to the lenders, but in fact were very, very difficult to get out of and were almost a, a form of slavery to the people who took them on. I mean, they would have uh, high prepayment penalties. They would have interest rates that would uh, begin in very low levels and then explode into high levels. And so unfortunately, you know, the regulators weren't really paying attention to these practices for whatever reason, whether they were actively not or passively not, what we can discuss. But, you know, the private actors in this partnership really um, took it to a level that had never that, that really was um, toxic for many, many borrowers and toxic for many, many investors, as we saw with so many losses in, in mortgage-backed securities. So it was a perversion of the traditional home uh, ownership idea, which is that you take out a loan, you pay it down over time, and you have a mortgage-burning party at the end of the line. And then you have a big nest egg that you can pass off to your sons, daughters, grandchildren, whatever. It now became a piggy bank for you to take money out. E equity extraction was a huge piece of this puzzle, which left people now severely underwater with their uh, mortgages, owing far more now than, they, uh, than the home is worth. So things like this, these were the new fangled ideas that were brought to, uh, to bear by the private sector in the home ownership push. But this was a good time. Your home price is going up. You go out on Saturday morning and you say, I'm rich. <laughs> <laughs> so in this good time, why did the price of houses go up? The interest rates stayed low. The, the market seemed to be supporting all this. And uh, as you say, gosh, everybody thought, well, isn't this wonderful? But we were not expanding our one part of our economy, and people were borrowing against these. And what about, let's, let's do regulation for a bit. You know, this is, the, this is a regulated industry. The banking industry is regulated. The uh, mortgage lending area uh, is regulated. Fannie Mae and Freddie Mac, federal whatever, <laughs> mortgage association, they're, they're regulated. What happened to regulation? What happened to the law? What happened to 
Congress, you have, you have members of the United States Congress, Barney Frank, Chris Dodd, names that you know, they come off very suspicious in this book. Well, you know, what, the reason that we focus um, on Jim Johnson, who was the CEO of Fannie Mae from 1991 to 1998, um, then left to become uh, the head of the Compensation Committee at the Board of Goldman Sachs, where he still is on the Board of Goldman Sachs. Still a very powerful person, but kind of an unknown, unknown name. People don't know that name associated with the crisis, and so we felt that it was important to you know, really describe some of the groundwork that he laid. And what it was was that this, this idea that he captured his regulator, that he made sure it was a 98-pound weakling, that he could uh, buy Congress really essentially with uh, not just campaign contributions, but with these really kind of very shrewd and sophisticated uh, grassroots efforts, they would open, Fannie Mae would open partnership offices all over the country and have the local members of Congress there to celebrate the ribbon cutting ceremonies when they were, you know, uh, financing a project, a housing project. It, it made Fannie Mae seem like a do-gooder. And so all of the uh, congressional people who were involved with these, you know, that was kind of a, a chit that Fannie Mae had uh, into them. But they were, he was able to sort of write the rule book, really, for how to co-opt your regulator, how to um, control Congress, and really control the outcome. And so that's why we focus on him. So he really defanged the regulator that was supposed to be strong, supposed to have been set up by the 92 Act to make sure taxpayers were protected. And then I, my feeling is that other financial institutions took a page out of his book and really understood how to do this. And so now we have this as a regular process. Now we have in Dodd-Frank, when the legislation was being written, we have bank lobbyists crawling all over the uh, members who are writing it. Uh, now that we are in the phase where the regulation is being written by the regulatory agencies, we have bank lobbyists crawling all over that process. This is something that you know we really have grown to become accustomed to, but in the early 90s, it was highly unusual. And so this was sort of a, a, a playbook that was just being written at the time. Now, there were many other regulators, Jim, as you know, who were asleep at the switch, the Federal Reserve Board, as far as basic things like lending practices and whether or not these, you know, cockamamie mortgages should have been allowed in the first place. Nobody was really reining this in at all. It was all part of the push to expand home ownership. But, I mean, uh, Gretchen has names, names in this book, and there are Federal Reserve economists who, uh, we have both worked for Forbes magazine, a very tough editor there, and as I said to her, the Federal Reserve economists, supposedly the brightest economists in the whole universe, they did reports and studies of these housing practices and the potential risk, and they didn't find them. They didn't find any risk, and they downplayed all the, all the, the, the risks. And, and I said, the way you described their work, this late editor of Forbes magazine would have thrown us out of his office if we reported. <laughs> if we went in with a story like that, he, he would have come close to firing us. Why did all of these allegedly bright people and the Securities and Exchange Commission and others simply not act or even acknowledge the, the reports of people who are in this room that things were getting a little out of whack and this was corrupt activity going on? Or well, I think that, you know, it's, it's broadly speaking a, a prime example of regulatory capture where the regulators are so in the mindset of the regulated entities that they oversee they discuss things with them, they're on the phone with them. It's really almost a mind meld between the regulators and, say, in this case, the bankers. And there, there grew this view that banks had become so good at analyzing their own um, books, analyzing what potential losses would occur, that they were allowed to set their own capital ratios, or at least to help the regulators determine their own capital ratios. So you have, you know, um, <clears throat> instances when capital was being, uh, there were many, many decisions that the uh, uh, worldwide regulators were making about how much, how much reserves a bank has to have on its balance sheet. The bankers would be crucially involved in those decisions and the Federal Reserve would carry their water. And so you have 
um, Roger Ferguson, who was a vice chairman of the Federal Reserve at this time, really being um, one of the bank's chief sort of almost spokesman in these discussions, very crucial, important discussions about capital requirements. And in fact, there we have one anecdote in the, in the book where he, the FDIC, which was the best regulator in this whole mess, they were trying to be more vigilant and trying to rein this stuff in, but would come up against a buzzsaw called the Federal Reserve, the Office of Controller of the Currency, the Office of Thrift Supervision, the SEC. So the FDIC was trying to be, was a hero, you know, in this. They were going to publish a study that described the impact, the bad effects of this lowering of capital requirements. And Roger Ferguson called the head of the FDIC and tried to persuade them not to publish this study. It was really interesting because it was so much taking the bank's point of view and why. This is a regulatory entity. It is not supposed to be an advocate for the industry it oversees. So this was a sense, I think, that grew up part of this idea that regulation was bad, of course, was part of it, but also inside these entities there was this, this feeling that these were not the adversaries, that these were our friends, that they would never do anything so foolish as to risk their entire business betting the farm. And so they let them really do what they pleased. We, we've all been through, or we are still going through, the great bailout, the great recession. How much has this cost the U.S. economy? Oh, my gosh. I mean, Jim, you know better than I do. Trillions. I, 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 trillions. I mean, hundreds of billions. The banks, banks, big banks that were not supposed to fail, that were too big to fail, have failed. And we've bailed them out. There's I a great th quote in here. The Congressional Budget Office, as she describes wonderfully, did a study that also said something's going wrong here. And a man named Marvin Fopp worked on that. And he said, well, this has begun now, and it's like a cancer. And then he said, it's a cancer that has metastasized. That's a very frightening word. And this is still in our economy. I think when you talk about the cost of this, I mean, we obviously have some figures. We know that. Fannie Mae and Freddie Mac are into the taxpayer to the tune of $150 billion. Um, we know what the costs of the TARP were. Um, forget what Treasury comes out with periodically that says we're going to make a profit on these things. I mean, it will be modest if, if there is one at all. I don't believe anything that comes out of Treasury. But, um, <laughs> you know, there are so many hidden costs that are really not accessible at this time. And I would say the most crucial one is the one that you bring up, which is that everyone understands that these entities are too big to fail. And so the, that is an unknown huge cost for the future because when they get into trouble again, we are going to need to ride to their rescue. And so what is that going to cost? You can't assess that now. So the very notion that we have reinforced the idea that these institutions can take all the risks and get the benefits of those risks while the things are going up, but socialize the costs by putting them on the taxpayer, that's an unknowable but huge figure when you're talking about too big to fail banks like Bank of America, JP Morgan, uh, Goldman Sachs, um, uh, Citigroup. So now instead of just having two entities that are too big to fail, Fannie Mae and Freddie Mac, we now have many entities that are too big to fail. So the biggest problem with Dodd-Frank was the fact that it did nothing to cut these institutions down to size. It talks endlessly about this rule, that rule. It's 3,000 pages long. Glass-Steagall, by the way, was 32 pages long. And it served us well for 66 years. So in all of those pages, nothing about these banks must be cut down to a size that is manageable, where they will not threaten the entire financial system if they go wrong. And the outcry from uh, one of the most prominent bankers in this country, Jamie Dimon, is, oh my god, these regulations are getting in the way of the economy. The book is on the, the, way, the way it has gotten into such a pickle. And of course, you said you don't believe anything out of Treasury. One of the villains in the book is Timothy Geithner. He's the Secretary of the Treasury. Other villains are Lawrence Summers, Robert Rubin, 
Alan Greenspan? Oh, hey, come on. <laughs> what, what, what possible development do you see if, uh, this is not a fair question maybe because the book doesn't go into that. It doesn't say, hey, we're, we're going to see the sun tomorrow. But what do you think as, as you do your continuing reporting on, on this situation? Well, there are a number of things that are, uh, I think, increasingly discouraging to people, Main Street people, who's, th those are the folks I care about. I don't care about the bankers and I don't care that they hate my guts, which they do. <laughs> I, people are concerned that there are two sets of rules in this country, that one, one group of people, powerful, politically connected institutions or individuals, play by one set of rules. And that set of rules involves bailing them out if they get into trouble. But Main Street, the everyday people, don't get anything but the back of the hand when they get into trouble. I think that's a very pernicious view to have permeating the society. And it is reinforced by the fact that not one high-level individual involved in this mess has gone to jail. And so pay, everywhere I go, people ask me, why is this? Well, I am not a prosecutor, so I don't know how to make one of these cases. But the fact of the matter is that sends a very disturbing message to people that if you can get away with selling $500 million of stock before your company implodes, based on mortgages that should never have been sold to people that generated enormous profits to you during the time of the heyday, and you don't pay the price for that, there is something very wrong with that. Now, I'm talking about Angelo Mazzillo of Countrywide. A citizen of Southern California. <laughs> and yes, the SEC sued him for insider trading because as he was furiously selling his $500 million of stock, he was also in internal emails saying, these mortgages are toxic, man. They are poison. You know, this is terrible. We shouldn't be selling these things. Meanwhile, he's selling his shares. So even as he claimed that the company was sound financially and doing the right thing, giving the right loan to everyone. Uh, so the SEC brings this case. Um, they settle the case, as they often do. Uh, Mr. Mozillo pays, I think, $22 million of a roughly $50 million fine. Bank of America paid most of it. The share. And a half. Sorry, 67 and a half. Uh, so Bank of America pays uh, most of it, or the DNO insurance, or somebody else. Somebody else pays most of it. The shareholders of Bank of America, essentially. So you know, this is just one example. I mean, I'm not a prosecutor. I'm not a lawyer. But there is a sense that nobody is being held accountable for any of this mess. And just to underline that point. Uh, you've all heard, and we are now in uh, the state of California, of course, we're in, yes, another debt crisis, and our debt may be downgraded. Who downgrades the debt? Standard & Poor's, Moody's, those kinds of names, these are the... Uh, the uh, they are play the, a starring role in this book also. Yeah, yeah, I mean, the, and these, these institutions are still <coughs> given the authority to say, oh, you've got a triple A, you've got a double A. One of them said the other day, well, the United States better try to keep its AAA rating on the bonds. We, we seem to be in this, this continuing pickle. It's a, sort of one of those negative feedback loops. The same people that were uh, kind of on the scene of the crime are in positions of even greater power in many cases, or have left the scene or in, and are enjoying the, uh, the fruits of their gains. And that, again, sends this signal, I think, that's very damaging to the idea of justice in America. Uh, we know that we have a lot of bitter political opposition in this country, but somehow I don't think it's directed at these people. It seems to be directed at government, or it seems to be directed at whatever, whatever makes you uncomfortable. So let's, let's, let's get away from high tone stuff. Do you, <laughs> what about the price of housing? Do you think everybody here who has a house or a condominium do you think the price is going to go up? We have 9% unemployment nationally, more here in Los Angeles. What about jobs? You know, 
Well, we're, we're both thinking about the economy. It's just a terrible um, situation still. I mean, I think people are surprised that this many years after the crisis started to erupt in really 2007, that we're still in this terrible circumstance is a reflection of a couple things. One is that the government's response to the crisis was to throw money at the banks uh, and really not to help Main Street. And so they put up these programs for loan modifications. The HAMP program is a disaster. And none of it was really um, focused on helping the individual. Um, and it was there was also a sense, I think, uh, that if you pursued some of these malefactors aggressively, that might destabilize the system. There has been this sense that we have to stabilize the system. It's That's the goal at all costs. And so you allowed the banks to keep on their balance sheet these uh, second liens, uh, you know, home equity loans of credit that are worth nothing, maybe 25 cents on the dollar. They're marking them at 85, 90 cents on the dollar. You're, you're not forcing them to really be truthful about the value of these assets. Those second liens play a very major role in why many loan modifications are not um, uh, given to borrowers, because the person who owns the second lien refuses to help when they are trying to write down the first mortgage. So you have this conflict of interest where the bank that services the loan also owns the second lien, and they have no interest in writing that down because it's going to give them a hit on their balance sheet. So you've had this, but I would say just speaking from 30,000 feet, it's been this idea that protect the banks at all costs, protect the system at all costs. And what that has led to is this kicking the can down the road about facing reality about many of these issues like these loans and their value, like the fact that you should you know, write down these mortgage uh, principal amounts because of the fact that so many homes are now underwater. Just to make a connection also, if the banks have these loans and they are not what they pretend, they are purported to be on their balance sheet, it answers the question as to why, if you're in a small business, it's difficult to get a loan from a bank Everybody, you can look at the figures and the bank says, yes, we have the money. And then everybody says, well, well then why aren't you lending it to small business? Because they don't really have the money. That's or they're afraid that their capital is going to take a hit if they do actually have to reflect the value of these oh, things. Sure. Yeah. And so they don't have money and, to lend. And you don't get a renewal uh, of any kind in the, well, housing markets can stay down for many years. It, they did in the early 90s, but only six or so years. Mm -hmm. That's many. Um, so, we're still frozen. Uh, what about, I don't know, you know, the next step in the economy or the next uh, more regulation or something, some change? Because some of this, there was something last night about uh, some African country where, uh, oh, it's supposed to be massively corrupt and uh, their president is visiting the White House and, you know, <laughs> it's, uh, it's, that's part of the United Nations and there's all sorts of nations. But if you read this book, and you should. This, it makes it sound like the United States has a corruption problem. That's what it is. I mean, if this happened in, a, in, in some far country like, uh, you know, Bulgaria, they say, well, that's the way Bulgaria does it. You know, the president and his <laughs> brother-in-law, they, they all do favors for each other. But we don't do that here. Not, not true. Well, it's, it's not quite as bold as that, you know, <laughs> and again, it, you go back to this idea that you could always uh, fend off any criticism by saying that you were for housing, and for housing for minorities, for immigrants, for first-time home buyers, that that was the goal. It was, um, it was a noble goal. It was expanding home ownership to, to people who wanted to own a home but had not been able to do so because they couldn't get the down payment together before. So, you know, my, my really, um, I guess the, the biggest paradox, the biggest conclusion I draw from this reporting and writing this book is the paradox that the very people that we were supposed to be trying to help with this enormous push, minorities, first-time home buyers, immigrants, um, lesser, you know, lower income people have been the most punished by this disaster. And so what is the, what kind of a government is that that would push this thing, allow it to happen, allow the private sector to hijack it, hijack it to such a degree that the most vulnerable members of the population 
are pursued the most aggressively with the most poisonous loans, putting them on the road to financial ruin, all in the name of home ownership and promoting home ownership and the greater good that it involves. So that, to me, is the biggest paradox. There are a lot of paradoxes in this story, that people in power then are in greater positions of power now is a paradox. Um, that the people who were jumping up and down to try to let people know that there was a problem uh, were slapped down and, in fact, you know, in many cases, uh, hurt by the powerful forces in this, in this partnership push. That's a paradox. But the paradox of hurting the people that we were proclaiming that we were helping is just the worst that I've seen in this process. I think, I think uh, you know, there's enough of, of, of me up here asking the questions. I bet everybody in this audience has a question, so, uh, okay. <laughs> How do you deal with the fact that this is such an incestuous pool of players? They go from being senior officials of companies to then gun the treasury. They go from being on each other's boards. They're big donors of political officials. How do you deal with all that until you get to some of that? I don't see us getting out of this problem. One of the, I think, more obvious conclusions that you can draw from this book is the revolving door between Washington and Wall Street has never spun uh, more you know, rapidly or um, disastrously as it did in this circumstance. And there just does not seem to be any appetite for even questioning that. Um, you know, I've covered Goldman Sachs in my um, role at the newspaper, and you know, Goldman Sachs is a just one example, but uh, of a company that often the CEOs go into public service, um, and you know, that has been traditionally an idea that they were serving the public. But you know, when you read some of the stories that we've all come up with, uh, many reporters, Jim included, about you know the incestuous relationship and the fact that it really isn't serving the public, it's you know, whatever, serving themselves um, or serving whatever this push is that was you know, designed to um, be ultimately profitable for that industry. And I don't see any, anybody you know, saying anything in Washington about curbing this. You know, there were some rules put in recently about you, know, you couldn't lobby um, if you left the Hill, you couldn't lobby for, I don't know, some amount of years. But, you know, it's the regulatory interchange, the revolving door with regulators is also hugely pernicious. And it just does not seem to ever um, become, rise to the level of a problem that people really want to address in a forceful way. So I agree with you. I have a three-part question. Okay. Oh, boy. <laughs> I'll have to remember them all. The first one is, you've addressed this recently in, in some of your articles in the Times. You know, the, the top five, their assets have increased by 10% in the last two years. So how do we finally break up the too big to fail banks? You have, you, I'd like to hear how, how can this be done? Uh, secondly, on Monday the 15th of September at 2 o'clock in the morning, New York time, Lehman filed for bankruptcy. In the next 48 hours, J.P. Morgan Chase gave them $138 billion after they filed bankruptcy. They were reimbursed by the Federal Reserve Bank of New York City by <coughs> 5 o'clock on the following Tuesday. I've seen nothing about this except one article in, in Bloomberg. I've even asked him about this, so I'd like to know what's going on there. And the third one is... <laughs> <coughs> I wish I knew. Anyway, go ahead. The third one is um, here at the Drucker School, they have in their thing, it says, we will continue to ask the big questions and to tackle the most important and intractable issues of our day. What do you see as the big questions and intractable issues over the next 10 years in this country? Okay. Great questions. Yeah, wow. Um, you know, the Lehman Brothers episode is not one that I have reported in depth on. And so um, I would, my guess about what was going on is that Lehman was a huge creditor. Um, I mean, sorry, uh, J.P. Morgan was a big creditor or had some relationship, and they were on the hook and the Fed bailed them out, as they will do with any one of these big, two big to fail institutions. <clears throat> um, so I'm sorry, I just can't answer that one. Um, but the question, the first question was, how do we break up? How do we break up? Okay, break well, up. you just, you just take 
away their ability to vertically integrate with all of these different businesses that they want to have. You know, the insurance companies, the um, stock brokerage, the, you know, Dodd-Frank tried to do that by um, eliminating the ability of these banks to have proprietary trading operations. What that means is that the bank uses its own capital to take risk and, you know, make bets. Uh, so this was called the Volcker Rule after Paul Volcker. Well, the, the pushback on this has been so enormous, and this was just one element, okay? This was just one way to make these banks spin off this operation, one measly operation. The pushback was so enormous, and the watering down of this idea was so, um, is still in the works, that the, uh, you know, it, it makes me feel that the idea of being able to chop them up into individual companies doing one task, i.e. an insurance company, a retail stock brokerage firm, an investment bank raising capital for, you know, uh, companies, that that's hopeless if they're going to push back on this idea that was in the legislation to spin off one operation, proprietary trading, and they're succeeding in watering that down. If they can succeed in that, then the idea of chopping these up is, is you know, really, really a bridge too far. But that is what is necessary. Simon Johnson, a former economist at the MIT, says we have to chop these things down to a size where they are not too big to manage and are not too, you know, threatening to the population. Now, the third question was, the oh, the big the issues. Big issues of the next 10 years, obviously, yeah, unemployment, crucial. You cannot have an economy come back without, you know, some um, ability for people to have jobs and, you know, feed their families and protect themselves for the retirement and long term. <clears throat> um, that requires education. That requires retooling of a task of a, of a workforce. That is, that's a huge deal. That, to me, is the big kahuna. We've got to solve that problem here. I have a two-part question. I hope one is easy, one's more philosophical. My mortgage is held by Fannie Mae now. Is it incorrect to say that that means it's held by all of us? And part two is, when we talk about regula regulatory capture, aren't we really saying that we're facing a constitutional crisis, that lobbying is protected in the Congress, right? Petition Congress for aggressive right. grievances, which any of us can do, and the more of us there are, and the more better financed we are, the more efficient we are at it. So. Aren't we really saying that right now we are in a massive constitutional crisis? Fannie Mae owns your mortgage. That does mean that we're all in it with you. So keep paying. Keep paying. <laughs> Don't default. Um, yeah, no, I think that, you know, uh, the, the, the role that lobbyists play, <clears throat> I wish that I were a constitutional scholar. I wish I had the long view on lobbyists and lobbying and whether it is worse than ever before. It feels like it is worse than ever before, but that may just be anecdotal, and it may just be because I am operating in a, in, you know, area where the institutional lobbying effort is massive and continuing and, you know, very persuasive. Uh, but yes, you know, the problem is that we, each of us, don't have a lobbyist. And so it's very hard for Main Street to have its voice heard. And until that, until we do have that kind of collective ability to rise up and have our voices be heard, then we're just really going to be the receptacle of all the losses and holding the bag. And I think that that's more and more what people are feeling. And I agree with you, it is coming to a crisis point. Woman in the green jacket, front row. Uh, thank you. I apologize, I haven't read your book yet, but I did watch the documentary, The Inside Job, mm -hmm. last year. And I'm just wanting to check a point. The main point they were making in that film was that during the Reagan eras, when it started, that the deregulation happened of the financial industry, that the financial industry was now allowed to do trading and not they, the separation of banks and trading companies was removed, and I believe that was the Glass-Siegel Act. Do you agree that that's the beginning point? Because you started it with Fannie Mae, but I actually, my understanding was it started with that deregulation. Well, the, the, th the thesis that regulation was bad certainly began under Reagan, um, but Glass-Steagall didn't fall until 1999. Okay, and so there were, they were chipping away at Glass-Steagall, you know, every once in a while there'd be a new thing that they couldn't do, that they could do that they had not been able to do before, like by, uh, you know, the combining Reform. commercial banks and investment banks. But so that fell actually in 1999. Then why is it the solution to put that back? 
because you know what they'll say to you is that things have changed so dramatically since 1932 when that law was written that we can't go we can't put the genie back in the bottle we have to recreate now you know to me it's pretty simple i think you could write a law that it, you know that cuts them that allows them to only have a certain business they can't have this you know all these different far flung operations that um, you know increase the risks and to the taxpayer ultimately um, so I don't really buy that argument, but that is what the argument is. And you know, we have things like derivatives that we didn't have in 1932. We have you know all kinds of newfangled things that Wall Street, in its infinite wisdom and creativity, has come up with to you know basically uh, profit on. And so you know, but you're you know ultimately Reagan started the thesis, but it really went you know viral. I would say in the 90s, and then when Glass Steagall fell, it was you know game over. And it's a reaction to the global economy, but that's a whole other matter. How do you explain the fact that the public doesn't seem to get it in the sense that uh, it's quite clear that the failure of regulation was a, con a considerable cause of the crisis, and yet the popular mood in the country is very much at the moment, anyway, uh, anti-regulation. Uh, now, admittedly, the, the whole controversy over the Health Care Act uh, generated anti-government uh, feeling among the populace, but still, the populace seems to feel that, okay, Washington should keep its hands off Wall Street. It's, it's just unex unexplicable to me as to how the public can fail to understand the nature of what needs to be done. Absolutely, agree with you 100 um, percent. The idea that these people who created this problem are swanning around Washington, throwing money at uh, congressmen and senators and not being, not sort of being ashamed, you know, and hiding in their trenches is amazing to me. I mean, that speaks volumes to me about the, the tone of this country, that they created the problem, they drove us into the ditch, and they're now trying to make sure, manipulate the process to make sure they can do it again. Um, you know, I think that you hear, well, you'll hear these arguments. Oh, well, if we regulate too uh, severely, like you mentioned Jamie Dimon said the other day, we will lose jobs. The jobs will go overseas. There's always, it's a, it's part of this really poisonous political atmosphere in a way, and things come down to sort of black and white, that if you're either for jobs and for business or you're anti-business and therefore you're gonna be pro-big government and government's gonna take over. Nobody really is thinking through sort of the, middle ground, you know, you take some from this side, take some from that side. There really does seem to be this either or mentality. I mean, I am really shocked by it because I would have thought that some of the populist outrage uh, would have arisen over this, that you would have people who are losing their homes, losing their jobs, really sort of standing up and saying, how can, this, how can these banks be given all of the benefits by the government since that's us, the taxpayer, it's our money. But I think these are complicated issues. I think people are stretched, you know, the, their family, they're just trying to put food on the table. I think this is a difficult issue to frame simply. And I think that Obama missed a huge opportunity when he was elected by installing some of the participants like Timothy Geithner in positions of power. He couldn't move away from it. He couldn't say that wasn't my deal, wasn't my problem. I'm gonna to explain to you what just happened to you and I'm gonna do my best to make sure it doesn't happen again. That was a huge opportunity that he missed and I will never be able to understand why. Uh, Mr. Kodish. Well, the simple answer is if you don't like what's going on, buy enough of Gretchen's book. <laughs> give, give, give them to your friends and they'll throw the bums out real fast. Well, um, I hope you're right. So in my mind, you're the foremost authority on Goldman and AIG. And since we're all here, could you share your favorite AIG Goldman story? <laughs> Which one is that? The, the, the phone call? In the, okay. Um, Mark Ahotis is one of the heroes in the book. He was a person who was trying to... Um, show the SEC that a particularly egregious subprime lender was really going out of control and harming a lot of people. And he had conversations over, what, three or four years with the SEC and nothing ever happened. And uh, that company um, basically sort of imploded like a lot of them did, but uh, investors lost about a billion dollars in that company's stock. And then many, many, many borrowers were hurt by their lending practices. So Mark is one of the uh, uh, people in the book um, okay, so AIG and Goldman Sachs, you know, I mean, I think that everyone um, remembers that in the heat of the crisis in mid-September, uh, Lehman had failed, AIG was on the ropes, and 
Um, I was trying to understand it. It was a mind-numbing time. But one of the things that I learned was that when the New York Federal Reserve Bank was uh, you know, the center of all of this activity of bailing out and just making these decisions about who gets bailed out and who doesn't, that um, at the time that AIG was crumbling, um, Lloyd Blankfein was at the Federal Reserve Bank of New York when they were making deliberations about what to do about that. AIG was an enormous company uh, with far-reaching tentacles. It was not, however, a regulated entity of the Federal Reserve because it was an insurance company. And the idea that uh, the Fed would be there to bail it out was obviously a difficult decision to make, very, very unusual. Um, the reason that I found it interesting that Mr. Blankfein was in the room at the Fed when this decision was being made to bail out the company was that there was an enormous relationship between Goldman Sachs and AIG. And in fact, AIG and Goldman's, there was a $20 billion um, uh, possible uh, hole in Goldman's pocket if AIG went bad. And so here is Mr. Blankfein, the head of, AI, the head of Goldman Sachs, in the room at the Federal Reserve Bank when they're making the decision about whether to bail it out. And I just felt that that was something that needed to be reported. Um, I reported it on a Sunday, I forget, September 23rd or something like that, or 28th. And um, that uh, day, I got a phone call from Tim Geithner, who called me up to tell me that I had misled my readers, uh, that Goldman Sachs did not have a $20 billion potential hit in an AIG failure that it was that the company was fully hedged, that it had put on hedges that would prevent it from being potentially harmed by the failure. And so therefore, that it wasn't a conflict for Mr. Blankfein to be in the room. And I said to, to Tim, I said, well, uh, did you examine the hedges? Because hedges only perform you know, in, a, you know, in a certain market. I mean, if AIG goes off a cliff, would those hedges have performed? Would the parties on the other side of those hedges been money good, or would they have failed also? very likely they would have. He said he hadn't examined the hedges, but that he was persuaded that Goldman Sachs was fully hedged. And I said, well, we'll, <laughs> I said, well, we'll just have to agree to disagree. But in any case, you know, here he was. This is a, a, a public servant. This is a member of the Federal Reserve Bank and you're calling me to yell at me about a story where I was reporting a fact that I thought people needed to know. And then furthermore, he went to my editor to complain about the story oh. later, which is, of course, in my business, taking it viral and ballistic, you know, that's, that's nuclear, that's the nuclear option. But in any case, that's the kind of, you know, pushback that you get when you try to report on these, uh, on these things. So, you know, luckily, we stand firm at the New York Times, but um, that was a really interesting moment for me because I felt that um, it was obvious to me that Geithner was really carrying water for Goldman at that point in time. And then later, email traffic showed that the CFO of Goldman had actually been in communication with Geithner, Geithner that morning before he called me. You discussed earlier that it's not easy to get money right now from the banks for lending. I just received a letter from Bank of America and Wells Fargo for $100,000. I'm a small businessman here in Los Angeles. So do you see it opening up? I mean, because these were two banks coming at me. One of them, both of them said 100000 Then they said, oh, we can get to 250000 And I'm a small businessman. So I don't know if that's just anecdotal or do you see the trend coming? That's you know, very, That's I, very good. You yeah. have equity. That's good. Hey. <laughs> Um, I, I, would, I hope that it's not just anecdotal. Um, it's hard for me to know. I hear a lot of people complaining that they are, aren't, um, you know, that they don't have access to this kind of money. But again, you don't know that their situation, maybe their credit is not as good as yours, maybe their business is not as solid, whatever. I mean, there could be an, any number of explanations for why you're getting that um, offer and others are not. Um, I would just be careful to make sure that there aren't a lot of strings attached and costs associated with that. Um, but you know, other than that, I'd, I'd say that that's a very good straw in the wind. Now I'm now I'm at a loss. <laughs> Who do I pick? I think you've had your hand up several times, I, right there I, with the gray. I have a loud voice. I think I'm worried that the same thing is happening again with the Consumer Financial Protection Bureau and Elizabeth Warren's appointment. So would you turn your attention to this so we don't have to come back in a few years and read your next book showing how <laughs> it got totally screwed up? What do we do? How do we get that? in a position where it actually is regulating the banks to the benefit of citizens. 
um, the question was about the Consumer um, Protection um, Board that's being set up by the Dodd-Frank legislation. And, you know, it's interesting because uh, there were, uh, there was an ability by regulators to, to protect consumers and they just fell asleep and were not at all. So the idea that you have to set up this institution is unfortunate because there were real rules that could have been impl implemented and or enforced to, sit, to protect consumers and weren't. Um, you know, I think that the problem with Elizabeth Warren is that she speaks truth to power, and she has, you know, uh, really alienated the banks. And again, it's this collegiality in Washington that, you know, you can't have uh, an outspoken critic of this very powerful group of people, you know, hired to do this job because it's it's just not its political third rail to allow a person who has a stated and, you know, pretty um, uh, vehement point of view, you know, protect the consumer, that even though that's what this thing is supposed to do. So again, it's another data point of how the banks are able to uh, manipulate the process and hijack uh, what was supposed to be a pretty, I think, simple idea. And it is unfortunate, and uh, I am watching it, but. One of the things about the, the banks, their stock is on the market, and those stocks are down. Because when the banks have all these activities, the investment community says they can't handle all that. And you're going to see problems. It's like when they had conglomerates. The, the deal with conglomerates is we have so many activities, it protects us. But what it does, it, you're, you're just as vulnerable at, at your weakest point. So the stocks are down, and that will lead to breakups of the banks. Could be, could be. That's a belief in the. Here, sir. We, we, uh, we send people to Congress to represent the interests of we the people. Have we lost control of that process all the way from local to the national Congress? You know, even our local, I feel that we've lost control. Have we? Well, I think that many, many signs point to that um, conclusion. I think that when I am down in Washington, and I'm not a Washington reporter, I'm not a political reporter, so I don't have to operate in that milieu that often, and I'm very happy about that. Um, because that, that is three-dimensional chess down there. I cannot begin to understand that. I mean, at least on Wall Street, Wall Street's pretty simple. You know, it's a zero-sum game. Somebody wins, somebody loses. But, uh, you know, Washington, man, that's a way more complicated thing. But, you know, the people that I see um, it just seems to me that there is this uh, over um, impact by the lobbyists, that the big corporations really do hold sway, that they are listened to, that they are heard, that there really isn't any balancing act going on, that that's all these people hear all day long. And it might not be that the corporations are both always on the same side, but they're hearing those from those people and they're not hearing from us and they're not hearing from average everyday people who are really hurting in a world of hurt. And so to me, I think there are many signs pointing to that process being broken. Two more, we have a woman with the red jacket and then the woman in blue who's had her hands up a couple of times. Oh, thank you. Um, I think this is a little bit on the order of politics makes strange bedfellows. I would think that many of us in this room consider ourselves liberal Democrats, and we are sympathetic to everything you've written. However, a lot of the questions that are being asked are being asked by what Bill Maher would fondly refer to as the teabaggers. Well, it's funny because, you know, this is one of those, this is one of those stories that there's blame on both sides of the aisle. There's no doubt about it. I mean, I'm not blaming the Democrats for this. This, the, you know, George W. Bush was just as much of a promoter of housing as Clinton was. But it seems like this is an issue that had everybody in it together. And that's possibly what made it so much worse, you know, and so much of a bigger problem. And it was many of it, much of it had to do with this was sort of the housing industrial complex. And there were so many people who benefited from this in the private sector. And the problem was that it was, it was very unusual from this standpoint that never before had regulators been roped into this partnership. And instead of standing outside and monitoring the activities and stepping in when they needed to do so. So I don't consider that political, uh, you know, Democratic, Republican, conservative, liberal. They have a job to do. They did not do the job. And if you want to promote something, 
that's fine. But you have to have people who are a balance to that and have an appetite to enforce that balance. And we just did not have that at all. I want to ask you about the collegiality uh, aspect. Um, do you see the press as being part of that, that mind meld so that they're not, a other than you and, and a few other people, are not asking the, the questions? Um, yes, I do. I think, um, unfortunately, the problems in our business um, uh, have created a situation where um, in some organizations, not certainly I don't c consider myself in this group, but there is a sense that go along to get along, um, that you're not an adversary, that you're part of the promotional team, as it were, of the companies that you're covering. Don't get me wrong, it's very difficult to cover a beat because when you are on a beat, you have to speak to the same people day in and day out, and it's a push and a pull, and sometimes you write stories about the companies doing well, and sometimes you write stories about them doing badly. And so, and, but you have to keep going back to that company, and so it's a difficult line to walk. But I think that the consolidation in my business and the, the threat, the, the, the lack of profitability, the uh, internet threat, the fact that newspapers are in such dire straits has made it increasingly difficult for people like me to um, stand up and do my job and not be a part of the you know, uh, inner circle. Uh, there are fewer and fewer publications that appear to want to do that. Um, I hope that they're still out there. I hope that there are bloggers that may take their place. I don't know. But there is a sense that, um, particularly for this crisis, the media really did um, fan the flames and did not ask the tough questions relatively early on when they should have. Why don't we take one more? Good morning. Um, I had one question. So you're standing up doing something few people have done you're pointing fingers very very publicly how has that affected i um, mean you personally in new york have you become like a persona non grata in a sense like when you go to events on wall street people point at you or i mean i'm just curious i mean you're very you're doing something that's probably everyone would a lot of people in power would have preferred you not writing this book yeah that's true well you know i have a big institution behind me the New York Times is, you know, um, a very, uh, you know, the financials are in, you know, flux at the moment. But I mean, it's a, it's got, it's got the right DNA for um, backing somebody who speaks truth to power, and that they understand that's what I want to do, and they really encourage it and back me up. You know, I don't want to be at these people's parties. That's right. <laughs> you know, a lot of journalists want to go to their parties, right. and they want to have them to their book parties. And they want, you know, it's a, it's a, it's a seduction that, you know, if Jamie Dimon takes my call, you know, I feel better about myself. Or if, you know, <laughs> he comes to my book party, wow, I must be important. You know, I just don't have that. I don't, I don't care. I have, my, I have a family. I go home to my family every night. I cook dinner. We have dinner together. I, that's who I want to be with. I don't want to be at these, these parties where the, you know, rich and famous are swanning around. So I, I'm kind of an unusual in that way, maybe. I don't know. New York is, you know, you can get into that groove and into that, you know, famous people thing. People don't like what I do. People complain about what I do. Uh, my editor has to take heat all the time for what I do. Um, you know, uh, there is an increasing rancor against um, what I do. You know, Goldman Sachs has taken an increasingly um, uh, aggressive stance against the reporting, you know, that Louise Story, my colleague, and I have done. Um, but, you know, that's part of the game. I mean, you know, I'm calling people out, and I've got to be uh, able to do that. But it, it requires a, a stamina and a backbone and an institution that has your back. And of course, you have to be accurate, and of course, you have to be right. That's right. premier importance. Um, and I'm not playing favorites. And so I think people know that. I mean, I, my, what I take away from it is the emails that I get from everyday people who say, keep going, keep at it, you've got to do it. You're the one that we read. We trust you. That's what makes my day. I don't care about going to a party with Lloyd Blank fine. And if, if you're a reporter, I've been a reporter for 48 years. That's true. You, have, you don't have friends. Nobody talks to you because they like you. But everybody has some kind of edge 
And so if you talk to one person, that person will have an enemy, and that, per that enemy will also talk to you. But that's the game, and it's a wonderful game. And the, the point about the newspapers and the press, the whole shift in the economy where uh, Gretchen has a, an institution that backs her. We have our own Los Angeles Times. It's suffered a lot. It's doing a lot, of, lot more of good local reporting. There's a piece in the New York Times this morning that says the, the amount of local reporting has, has diminished in the United States. Why? Because the publications, you know, going for your daily breeze, your Pasadena Star News, and local reporting at every le reporting at every level is just necessary. Because if people get in power, trust me, it's, it's, it's addictive and it's profitable. That's the problem. Listen, this has been a great session. Thank you very much. Uh, thank you. Thank you.